Just a little bit of what we're going to do tonight. Um, we're really going to turn it over to Mark and Chris, who are going to give you a you know, little overview on Challenge Success, because this is really a collaboration between the PTSO and Challenge Success. And then they're going to turn it over to our speakers, and we're so excited to have them here this evening. They've agreed to do the presentation and then do a Q&A following that. And then once that is over, we invite you to come outside and to meet and greet them. So um, thank you again for coming, and welcome. I'm really just going to say hello, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to these guys. But thanks for coming out. Um, I don't know if we have all 109 people who signed up, but thank you for being the part of that 109 that's here. Um, if you don't know, I'm Jamie Chisholm. I'm the principal. Proud to be the principal of Wellesley High School. Um, you know, as we've done this challenge success work over the last four or five years now, um, I, feel, I feel like we keep evolving um, to try to tighten what our community needs. Sorry. Is it? They're telling me the microphone is muffled, Brian. We, we have the best technician anywhere in the back, so if anybody can fix it, it's Brian. I'm, okay, so I'm supposed to keep talking. I don't sing well, so. Um, is it getting any better? It sounds like it's a little better. Okay, so it'll be important when our speakers get up here, so thank you for that. Um, so anyway, I think, you know, we've been evolving and, and um, kind of, we learning about the, the national group and, and learning about some of the, the tenants and then applying them and reapplying them to our context here at Wellesley High School. And I, that's one of the things I'm most excited for about the power of agency uh, and this work that you're going to hear about tonight is that I think um, giving our kids agency, and you're going to hear a lot more about people know more about it than I am in a minute, um, is really key. Um, we, we know that this world is difficult and stressful and there are a lot of challenges that our kids have to face. They should have to face challenges. That's important. Um, we need to give them the tools to do that well um, and part of that is agency. So um, I'm excited. I've really liked this message um, and so I've, I've, got, I've seen um, this presentation before and I know you're going to like it. So um, I'm happy you guys are here. And now I'm going to turn it over to Mark Bender, who is our assistant principal, who is in charge of leading our internal challenge success efforts. So here's Mark. Thank you. Um, thanks for everybody for coming out tonight. I'm going to keep this really brief because fortunately, all of you just received an email, I think, from Dr. Lucier uh, explaining challenge success. So if you didn't see that, um, check your inbox from, I think, about two days ago. That gave a nice overview of challenge success here in the Wellesley Public Schools, specifically here at the high school. This is about our fourth year with challenge success, and we continue to evolve with it. We continue to make um, an organization that is a large organization that provides a lot of research and information and bringing it here and making it unique to the community of Wellesley. So for those of you who have not heard of Challenge Success before, I was gonna give you about two minutes and then we're gonna jump right into our presentation. Um, Challenge Success, as you can see up here, partners with schools, families, and communities to embrace a broad definition of success and to implement research-based strategies that promote student well-being and engagement with learning. As we mentioned tonight, is a collaboration between our PTSO, um, community members who have been working with um, us with Challenge Success here, as we really focus on making sure that these are learning opportunities, that we're really partnering with uh, community members, families, hearing the challenges, and helping to develop the, the village approach that we're all so used to, to, to hearing about. Um, so Brian, if you don't mind uh, going to the next one. Um, the overview of Challenge Success here at Wellesley Public, School, uh, at Wellesley Public Schools is that we are now taking Challenge Success that started here in the high school. We're, we just started it last year at the middle school. That's going to continue to evolve. And then we're moving it um, to make it a K-12 to basis here, uh, which will really be an umbrella approach for so many of the many social-emotional learning aspects that we will be continuing to look to develop and introduce in the Wellesley Public Schools. Um, here at the high school, where our focus has been, uh, in the last two years, we've really been focusing on developing a uh, community. So we transitioned from developing well-balanced students to focusing on the community that we're building here in the high school. Uh, when we talk about community, we focused on the orientation and the transition to the high school from the middle school. Uh, we've focused on the first, not only first day of school for the ninth graders, but the first three days of schools for our students with a real focus on developing the relationships. Research has showed us, uh, as well as our gut instincts have told us, 
that the more we get to know the students that are in front of us, uh, the better they're going to want to perform, the better the relationships are with teachers in, in your classrooms, uh, the more that we are going to improve the learning that, that occurs and the results will show. So we really focus in the first several days on building relationships, kind of putting a break on getting the first homework out and the first exam date in the calendar and let's get to know each other at first. Um, so that's what the ninth grade transition challenge success has been supporting in the first few days of school. Um, as you remember, the theme of community exists here, so we're trying to increase our level of climate of care. So we have a student group that has evolved the challenge success, and they've been doing a number, a variety of things of trying to introduce fun and exciting things for the student body here. We've been really focused on trying to build more spirit in our school. We feel like the more belonging that the students feel in this building, again, the better they'll be performing. So we're trying to do a wide variety of things, small steps, but every step is a worthwhile step to build a greater sense of community in the school. Um, excuse me. Let's see. So challenge success also, uh, when we talk about community engagement, um, this is where we partner with community members and we're always looking to continue to grow in this aspect. Um, but we're looking to have, um, hear from community members and, and allow, uh, basically have that developed to align with speakers, such as what we're doing tonight, right? So we're trying to develop and find people out in the community who are going to help us work in our own houses, right? Uh, when we're seeing challenges with our own students, sons and daughters in the evening, from homework to levels of anxiety about things that are going on, we're just developing a workload that's even keeled for each of us individually and that represents what we really want in our homes. That's what we're looking to develop through and provide information through our speakers. So let me pass that over now and we'll do an introduction for our speakers. That's just an overview of channel success and, and now we'll move a little bit more specifically into this evening. Thanks, Mark. Um, thanks everyone for coming out tonight. It's uh, really you know, special to be able to take time out of your evening and your busy lives to come out. Um, but I can't think of a greater investment than, you know, our kids in our community. Um, my name is Chris Cavallarano. I'm the kind of parent liaison for a challenge success here at the high school. And um, I can't, you know, thank the team of people that are here tonight and behind the scenes that make these events possible. So it's, it's really helpful to know that there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of enthusiasm around challenge success and its mission. And I'm really, uh, really excited to have Paul and, um, and Tony here. Um, I actually knew uh, Tony years ago uh, through an introduction of, from my wife um, in his book, uh, The Way of Boys. And when I heard about his work in partnership and collaboration with Dr. Knapper um, on agency, I thought, wow, here's an opportunity for parents, for teachers and students to really take ownership and really look at kind of the, the world through their own personal lens and authenticity and to be able to kind of move forward in you know, a very kind of real, holistic way. Um, so without further ado, um, Paul um, has a background in um, management psychology as a practice in Boston, servicing Fortune 500 co companies, uh, startups, um, and uh, also has spent time at the Harvard Medical School. Um, Dr. Rao as well um, is a practitioner of cognitive behavioral psychology, um, sought after subject matter expert, um, on agency and other subjects, um, but we're really thrilled. They're uh, based out of Lexington, so we're really lucky to have them kind of in our backyard, and we're looking you know, forward to kind of engaging with them to you know, learn more about agency. Hopefully you've taken the assessment. We're gonna circle back with everybody after the presentation to get your thoughts, and we're hoping that this is the first step in, um, in more personal agency in our community. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And um, I wanted to start off with something that feels a little unrelated, but I know that you rushed to get here. I know that you probably had a prepared dinner for some little ones early, or you fought traffic, or you had an incredibly long day, or you had a billion texts or a hundred emails running through your head. And I know that the accumulation of all this does all sorts of things to our bodies and our minds, but we're, we're high achieving and we strive. And, but I'd like for us just for a minute to just, we're gonna take a deep breath, but I wanna do it as a group at the count of three. And when you do it, you do it more from, maybe some of you know how to do this, from the lower part here, right? Just where the belly is, the diaphragmatic breathing, not from up here. This is the kind of thing that I would have done at Children's Hospital years back when I was helping kids go through pain treatments and doing stress-related disorders. 
is you, you, you want to get them to have control and, over their body by clearing out their mind. And we talk about mindfulness, meditation, all sorts of techniques. But going back 20, 25 years or so, um, it really just comes down to the breathing. So we're going to do this at the count of three. You're going to take that breath in. It's going to be more from this lower part of your body. And then just let it out slow. You ready? One, two, three. Did you hear it? You were all connected there for a minute. You all were demonstrating just a little moment of agency right there. Do you, do you feel the muscle tension go down? Uh, for a moment, you just signaled your brain to just sort of bring the heart rate down a little bit. Body temperature changed slightly as blood flow changed. And if you were to continue to do that more and more, you would feel more centered, more grounded. So I want that out of the way so that you can leave a lot of the stresses that you may be feeling outside for a little while. I want to introduce you to the idea of human agency. And when Paul and I decided to write this book, it was going to be a challenge. We knew that. Uh, being in the field of psychology, we were pretty familiar with the word agency. A lot of people think of agency as an educational buzzword or an academic word. And, it, and it, you may be hearing it. If you're going with your kids to any colleges to look at them, you're going to hear that word pop up quite a bit when people are describing what they're hoping that they can deliver at the schools that you're interested in looking at. Um, agency is not new. Agency is something that we've been hearing about for a while, but it's, it has been more academic. Paul and I are the first to bring this concept more into the public light and to be able to define it in ways that people can learn it for themselves, lead themselves better, lead their children better, and teach it particularly for kids who we do know are showing higher levels of stress than we've seen in many, many, many years. We've come across a lot of really great people to interview and across the country, and we've been mining all sorts of great ideas and great thinkers. Um, we come across wonderful quotes, and two of our favorite are up here right now. Um, Susan Rice, who, you know, talks about the idea of, you know, we have progress because we make it happen. Salman Rushdie talks about, is the world shaping us or do we shape the world? Now, these are some of our favorite quotes about having agency, the ability to control our bodies, take care of ourselves, clear our minds, and be able to make informed decisions that put us on paths that mean something to us. Taking control. My favorite quote, though, is this one from a little boy, a fifth grader named John, who came in this fall, barreled in, hadn't seen him since the spring before, jumped on a swivel chair. If any of you have been to my office, know this is where a lot of these boys like to go. And I said, hey, you know, fifth grade, this is awesome, right? You're, you're going to have a lot more control in your life now. This is great. I think I've said this to him last year. And he, his eyes got wide as saucers. And he looked at me, and he had this moment of like an epiphany, and he said... I can control my life? Literally hadn't thought about it at that level. He was actually also a little bit mad. Like, I can control my life? Like, why didn't you tell me this last year? Like, I had to go through all this? John is just turning a developmental corner somewhere around fifth grade to sixth. Your kids, if they haven't yet gone through, will go through a major developmental shift that puts them into young adulthood, for which they are able to tap into much more agency than they could have prior. But something is in the way. Something is making agency harder and harder for all of us, particularly guys like John, to be able to feel more in control of his life. Let me show you something. This is a graph from a study that in any other situation would feel very positive. It's an upward trend. It goes across decades from 1930 to 2010. Clear upward trajectory. 
if this was gross national product, if this was the self-esteem of your kids, if this was math scores, we'd be thrilled. You probably know where I'm going with this. It's a history of anxiety in the United States, and it's been climbing steadily for years. Now, this is based on one of the better and large-term studies that has pulled together, in this case, 52,000 measurements of college age and high school kids over these decades and been able to compare them across the years. And one has to ask, well, where do we worry? At what point? I would draw a line right here, right across, probably around 60th percentile on this particular measure of anxiety that's been given out to all these young people. You don't ne necessarily have to be at the 50th middle percentile and lower because a little bit of anxiety is actually great. It's a little bit of stress and worry that motivates your system. A little adrenaline is good. Sharpens focus, motivates. So we don't want to eliminate it, but we have to know when it's too high and when it's actually making us perform lower. It's somewhere around 1950 that this thing begins to really peak to the point where the population starts to talk about an age of anxiety. When Paul and I were looking through some of the history, we came across writers, uh, there were poets, there was music written, and it was popping up in some of the magazines of the time. They were calling it the age of anxiety. They had no clue what was coming, <laughs> you know? They thought this was, and it was. The world was more, it felt accelerated. The world felt more pressured. But it was an exciting time. It was post-war. Uh, the economy is booming. In fact, what you're seeing behind me doesn't correlate to the economic cycles. The researchers did a fantastic job looking for explanations as to what was possibly driving this. By 1980, we have since learned, by looking back, beginning in 1980, average school-age kids were showing anxiety on par with child psychiatric patients, inpatients, of the 1950s. You can see all those lines are just starting to go up. But it's really when we get to going into the new century that we really see that most of those dots are above the red line. At this point, we're calling it the age of overwhelm. That's the term that Paul and I are using to describe not just I'm anxious and I worry and I think about things too much, but that there are moments when you can't think clear. There are moments when you just get discombobulated and you sort of just stop. This is continuing, if not climbing, because we know data from other data sets for example, Stress in America survey. Every year, the American Psychological Association just goes and looks at different populations across the country, different age groups, and reports back. And one of the things they find is in the 15 to 21-year-old age range, we're seeing sort of the highest rates of I'm so stressed reported than we've ever seen. And we know that anxiety disorders are peaking among the general population in the United States. Now, there's a lot of good news here because while in America we seem to be climbing in anxiety, it may be that the causes are induced by how we choose to live and how we choose to think, the behaviors and ways of thinking that we have. And that's what Paul and I wanted to do. We, we wanted to bring what we thought would really truly address this, if you will, like a silent epidemic in ways that any of us could use. Other than that, agency, which we believe counteracts this. As agency climbs, anxiety plummets, and vice versa. But up till now, it's been mostly an academic concept. So an exciting and a wonderful finding from what we did. We interviewed about 100 people across different parts of the country, people who were identified to us by others as having high agency. And we also mined our clinical and our consulting work and realized that there was an interesting relationship between anxiety and stress and confidence. And this is key. Now, before I go on and show you the relationship, I just want to break down and explain the difference between anxiety and stress briefly. We tend to lump them together. 
In fact, your physician might. You've been feeling anxious, you've been stressed, you've been worried. We do pull them together and just think of them as the same. But for a moment, I want to explain the difference. On the right side, stress is just your body's reaction, your physiological changes that take place automatically in your body when you think there's something stressful around you. It doesn't have to be, but as long as you perceive it, your body reacts. That little exercise we just did a minute ago would have just brought that down slightly. So your heart rate would go up, your respiration would go up, your muscle tension would go up, a little bit of adrenaline gets released. The problem is that these two are related so that these moments of being stressed physiologically then pump up the emotional response. Those are feelings. So they are different. And we'll come back to this at the very, very end. But now I want to show you what the relationship is. We were seeing, as anxiety and stress was reported to be higher, in people that we interviewed and we worked with, their confidence levels plummeted. The great news is this could be inverted. It wasn't necessary that they had to think just of medications or therapies um, or do tons of mindfulness and meditation, but there was something about their levels of confidence. If they could find a way to boost their level of confidence, they in fact could get anxiety and stress low. And also they'd be on top of their game. Their performance increased. They were actually able to do more with all the, without all the angst. And we realized that this grouping down here, grounded, self-directed, creative, connected, and particularly making good decisions was actually about human agency. So we saw a terrific opportunity here. We knew how to coach and help people out of worry and anxiety and increase their performance. Achievement could go up. Their abilities could be sharpened. Their passion could go up. We knew how to do it. But we had to distill what were these key, what we call behaviors and ways of thinking. Here's the act definition we're using right now. The simplest thing is you are your own agent. You're an agent for yourself. You take charge of your body, your health. Because once your body and your health are good, you know, if you think about that, that is the hardware for everything else that's going to go on in your mind. All your thinking is based on how healthy you are. Are you sleeping? Are you eating right? Do you get enough exercise? Do you get outdoors enough? Once the body is healthy and the mind is clear, then we can move to controlling our emotions. Step one. Step two, this allows you to engage in more independent and critical thinking. With this, you now can make reasonable, good quality, sound decisions. And, and you're going to see that as we go through these practices with you, the seven practices, that it really culminates to this idea of sound decision-making. Now, we could have stopped at number three, but we didn't. There was one more left, we realized. How many times have you felt like you had made good decisions, but you just couldn't move forward with it? You kept thinking about it, you kept worrying about it, or some new piece of information came at you and stopped the process of you going into confident action. So this agency system that we propose really requires that people not only just get to the point of making sound decisions, but they act on them with confidence. There are some people we need to thank and nod to, uh, theoretically. Uh, and one major one is Al Bindor, who's still at Stanford, um, I think in his early 90s, late 80s, uh, in many ways considered the father of agency. Uh, he started talking about self-efficacy back in the 70s and the 80s and then began to talk about it as agency. Again, all theory. Abraham Maslow. How many of you remember Maslow's hierarchy? Everyone re remembers Maslow because of the pyramid, and it turns out that he never put it in a pyramid. Some branding expert or someone decided somewhere along the way to put this into a pyramid. Everybody remembers Maslow. And what's great about Maslow is once your basic needs are taken care of, you can move to self-actualization which is about agency. I've since learned by delving deep into some of his history, he was working on papers around human agency around the time that Bandura was also, until his untimely death uh, in his 60s. Paul and I also uh, go back a little further into more uh, older territory, theoretically, if you will, Eric Erickson, who, by the way, settled in Boston somewhere around the turn of the last century and practiced here and worked at Harvard 
Um, and he had a, a stage theory about all the levels we have in our entire life with a lot of uh, hope and optimism and actually a lot of points along those steps, if you will, where human agency is really central. Your kids, most likely, are just in that step there between grade school and high school. You know, figuring out, like, I can show what I have through industry. It's now time to figure out who I am. So these are the types of models that we pulled together to sort of enrich the idea of this. But the basic idea was to come up with a model that any of us could look at and any of us could then enact. It's got seven principles. We have put them in sort of like a wheel or, if you will, a, a clock. And we have them organized starting with control stimuli up at the top there, just almost at sort of the one o'clock mark if it was a clock. And then we've got associate selectively and move next. Those first three are what we call behavioral principles because behavioral principles are concrete, they're available to us to enact, they're not hard to learn. It's mostly about changing the behaviors we have. That's a lot easier than the next group of four coming up. They are also terrific for us focusing how to build agency in children, particularly up to about fourth or fifth grade or so. Once kids go from fourth, fifth grade and up, it, things are gonna change somewhat. If you want kids this young to feel that they have power in their life and control, Nothing feels better as a human being than that. Focus on the first three principles, the behavioral principles. The next four are called cognitive principles. And typically, we think of this as being more accessible once kids reach about 11 or 12 years old. Remembering John from the earlier slide, who was suddenly amazed he had control in his whole life, he was entering into that era. Jean Piaget calls it formal operations. More abstract reasoning, more logic, critical thinking, metacognition, the ability to sort of leave myself for a moment and think about how I think. Those are things that really are not going to show up until about 12, 11, maybe even 13. Once that is in place, now many of the cognitive principles for which Paul's going to walk us through after I do the behavioral ones come into action. Now, it isn't like we don't care about positioning them as learners when they're young. We certainly do that. We certainly help them manage their emotions and beliefs. But if you think about it, they're not doing it themselves. We're, they're doing it through us, externally. Now, we also wanted, Paul and I, to measure these. Uh, we thought we had something that really could define agency. And up till now, nobody had defined it this way. So we decided to set out and try to measure it. So we pulled together all sorts of possible items that would have represented each of these seven principles and began testing them out on groups of people. We piloted it with people, different parts of the country and different parts of the world. And we were able to then come down to the best items that seemed to hold together. And then with those, realize that they not only seemed to cluster together into this construct we were calling human agency, but they also correlated really well with two, one or two other measures that it, they should have. One was hopefulness, scales of hopefulness. If your agency is relatively high, you're more hopeful. Also, self-efficacy, hopefulness, optimism, and self-efficacy. These are the scales for which our scale seems to correlate really highly with. So it worked in the direction we wanted. Now, a lot of you here may have actually taken the online inventory that we provided. And what we decided to do is just very quickly pull those results together and just show you what they look like graphically and point out how we would do this if we're in a school system. Paul does this in companies and corporations and with executives in leadership workshops. Um, but we've gone into a couple of schools and we actually do this with teachers as well so that teachers can feel like they have agency and then how to learn how they can bring it to kids who are younger. So let's take a look how you guys did. Uh, basically, if you look at each of these bar graphs, they're just one per each of the seven practices. If you look at position self as learner in the middle there, you'll notice that there's no green band on the bottom. And that's because the group that took this, and I think it was something in 70 plus people that we averaged these scores with, didn't report any 
gaps around that. They really felt pretty confident about their ability to be good learners. It made perfect sense. When we talk to parents, parenting groups, we tend, when we use this instrument, to find that they're, they do very solidly on positioning themselves as learners. They're curious, they're open-minded. I mean, who came tonight? Who would come to a talk to learn something? So it makes perfect sense. That's, in fact, a real strength for you. You also have another relative strength. In the last one, deliberate, then act. And Paul will go through that a little bit later with you, but basically, you value the deliberation process. You think things through rationally. You know sometimes it's important to make good decisions, and you give yourself time to do it. And when you do, you tend to act decisively. Again, it's a strength. Your weakness, if there is one, is more in the control stimuli. That's where we have the highest green band, if you will, just under 30% of you are really feeling it's a struggle to deal with all the information and stimulation trying to get into your heads nowadays. And actually, we're finding this almost across the board. Uh, we've actually given this out to superintendents at a meeting in DC, and, and they too were struggling with this one. This is, this is not an, an unusual one for people living in the 21st century, in the information age. We are finding that this is the one that is having the biggest gap areas for folks. So I'm going to walk you through the first three principles, one by one. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on them, but just enough to give you a sense of what they're about. The first one's control stimuli, and of course, what do people think immediately? Like, okay, Tony, I get it. Shut off the screens. <laughs> you know, like, you probably heard that five times before you got here today, right? We already know that. Get rid of the phone. Turn it off. Leave it in another room. Just stop, right? All right, first of all, in full disclosure, this is my phone from Sunday when I got the word that my screen time was up 124% from the last week. I was on this thing for four hours and 11 minutes a day. Now it's like a little over twice of what I apparently normally do. And I'm thinking to myself, where did that two plus hours go? I lost it, it's gone. Did I really need to do that? What was it that was keeping me there? I know some of it was work, some of it was news, there was texting, there was like, what am I doing on this thing? I'm glad that finally, if your phone does this, it's great, because every now and then it's good to get a little reminder of how much of your human life is spent on the device. 124%. So I don't want you to think of just shut it off. I want you to think about what is it that's getting into your brain. To really control stimuli, you have to ask yourself things like, you know, the quality of it is really one thing that I ask parents in particular to be thinking about. Is it like just stuff to fill the time? Is it entertainment only? Is it just fun gaming? Well, fine. It's, but then think of it, if you will, like, like food, nutrition. Is it junk food? Do we have junk information coming across? One could make the case that a lot of the information now coming to us, it's not only just quick and rapid, which is, of course, overstimulating our brains and making it hard for us to think clearly. But it's also just sort of filling us up and maybe starving, if you will, all the other senses of our body. I want people to realize that they need multi-sensory experiences. You know, if you're cooking, it's a multi-sensory experience for what the brain was designed to do. If you're out gardening, if you're taking a walk, if you're in the woods, I don't care what you're doing, you could, but, but not just being only on a screen, you know, for that extra couple of hours that I, I missed out on, I was just having some visual inputs. The brain doesn't want that. In fact, it stresses the brain out, and when the brain is stressed, it can't think as well for itself. The most obvious culprit, of course, are our smartphones. Now, if you think about them as, I can just sort of shut them off and keep them on me, fine. Think again. First study of its kind, two years ago, looks at even when phones are shut off, the proximity to where they are to your body declines your cognitive capacity. Here's something from the study itself. Each of these bars represents a condition. You know, a few hundred young people, college age, were tested. Basically, they didn't know what the study was about. So say a hundred of them come in, they're going to sit in front of a computer monitor and just do a couple of cognitive tasks. 
like a, a bunch of tests. And the researcher says, oh, wait a minute, you have a phone? Oh, yeah, just do me a favor. Shut off the phone and just put it right next to you. Put it upside down so you're not looking at it. Fine, big deal. Then another hundred people come in. Oh, oh, you have, you're going to sit at this computer monitor. That's great. Do you have a phone? Oh, yeah, listen, why don't you put it in your book bag? Why don't you put it in your, in your, in your, in your coat pocket? Just leave it right next to you. So now it's a little further away. Both are shut off, but now it's a little further away, out of sight. Last group comes in. You're going to sit in front of the monitor. Oh, you have a phone. Whoops. Why don't we put it in a locked box out in the other room, and it'll be safe. Shut off. There's no reason, no logical reason, why if you're having your phone next to you, you have the worst performance on the cognitive tasks. And if it's further out in another room, you have the best. It makes no sense. How many of you, I mean, the decline is incredible. How many of you have your phones with you tonight? <laughs> Let me try it another way. Who doesn't have their phones? I know you don't. You left it in the, left car, it in the car, which is a rare occasion. Yes. <laughs> I bow to you. I bow to you. Yeah, yeah, you lost it, right? Yeah, 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 I lost it. <laughs> um, so I have to really jump around like a circus monkey to get your, your full undivided attention because you have your phone somewhere near you. And you're asking yourself, that doesn't make any sense, right? In all of those conditions, the phone is off. What is it, like invisible gamma rays and mental kryptonite? Your brain is cueing you constantly to know where your phone is. Why? Because you hold it all day long. You keep it on your body. You stare at it lovingly, often more than your loved ones that you live with. Like you have this thing as part of your life, and your brain thinks you need it to survive. So apparently, you've really got to get this thing away from you. So we talk in the book a number of new rules, and we explain how people try to do them. You go out to dinner, you leave it in the car. Nobody at the table if we're eating. So those community social events absolutely have brand new rules. Never in a bedroom. Never in the bedroom. And for young people, even more so important. The next one, and this is the second of the behavioral principles, is a little bit strange, um, a little mysterious, um, often my favorite, um, associate selectively. The people you just happen to live with, be around, associate with, work, congregate with, who are in your neighborhood, they affect your mood, they affect your behaviors, they actually affect your health. It turns out that we are intimately connected, neurologically connected with one another. We have mirror neurons. And it turns out that emotions and behaviors are all brought in and automatically replicated in our heads when we see them out in the world or if we feel tension in a room or when people laugh or dance and we feel that contagion of wanting to sort of join in. We're incredibly strong social creatures. Sometimes we're, we're very herd-oriented, like herds of animals. So knowing this, we have to ask, how important is it that we walk ourselves through the relationships in our lives, the places we live, the way we relate, and can this be a game changer in who we are to give us greater personal agency? Um, a very recent and important meta-analysis study of children who are in poverty, who have chronic traumas. Uh, this is a great study for us to learn from. It's a little bit like the canaries in coal mines, if you will. What is it that this group, what variables help these kids most? You would think it would be certain educational changes. You would think it would be, you know, breakfast in the morning, and you would think it would be um, you know, better housing. And, and, and yes, those things certainly, certainly mattered. Access to healthcare, all that. But the number one thing that actually improved their outcomes in many, many ways over time was just the company they kept, the people they were around. All these relationships really mattered and how close they were. So where do you start? You can actually map this out. You can do this for yourself. I do this with kids in the office. I actually will have them map themselves and say, okay, right in the middle, I just want you to tell me, that's you, great, make a circle, all right? Start telling me all the different people in your life. Now, where do those circles belong? How are they connected? We provide people with maps, if you will, cognitive but, but visual maps of like what their relationships are like. Otherwise, you don't think about this that way. And if you can't, you can't 
start to question, how much exposure do I have to people who make me feel negative? How much exposure do I have to people who support my goals and make me feel good? I want to downplay one and decrease. I want to upplay, increase the other. But let's be realistic. There are a lot of relationships that we have absolutely no control over, true? Stuck, right? A lot of the kids will come in and say, I've got a really bad teacher this year. <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> they're strict, they're this, they're that, there's homework, and they, they, just, they just go off. So they, they, they have this sense that they're completely stuck. Uh, sometimes we live near people who stress us out. Sometimes we're in families where people there can really harm us and stress us out. Um, work situations are classic. So there's a lot of situations under which we can't just have that luxury of, all right, I'm going to spend less time and more time. It's not that simple. But we ask you to look at it this way. Don't just head for the door. <laughs> Don't give up immediately. I, if you're in a stuck relationship, if your kids are in a stuck relationship, sometimes it's a team or it's a coach that they don't like, just don't give up. We ask people to think about setting limits with others. Start setting boundaries. Find your voice. That's an agency piece. Find your voice. Advocate for yourself. See if that makes a difference. The other thing is to actually see if you're not in some way contributing even accidentally to the problem. So that's under attempt to change the dynamic. So I have a lot of kids who will come in and tell me like how the teachers just don't like them. And I'll be like, really? The teachers don't like you? Show me what you do when they're talking. Like, let's pretend I'll be the teacher. And you catch them the fact that they're, they're looking around, they're looking down, they're making faces. And then I ask them to empathize for a minute. What do you think it's like if you're watching that? And is your body language in some way making the teacher feel a certain way? Could that be part of this? So I, I want them to be open-minded to changing themselves to see if they can change the relationships they're in. We do this in situations with bullies. We do this in situations in conflict. And then, if all else fails, by all means, it's time to set extreme limits. Sometimes report behaviors, sometimes end relationships. Yeah, we're not going to be Pollyanna about it. But over, overall, keep the better relationships closer and the others not. People ask, what about social media? This is an average Twitter account. So think of all the potential influences of all the people and how, how complex this is now that a lot of our relationships have been moved online, particularly social media for young people. And finally, the third of the behavioral techniques we call move. And it's not as simple as just, well, just get some exercise. No, we don't mean it that way. It's more complex. It's about the general health of the whole body, rest, nutrition, downtime. When the body is imbalanced, your emotions are balanced. When your body is healthy, you make better decisions because you have clearer thinking abilities. We know there's a direct correlation between all those and all the research that we mined. We also see this interesting relationship popped up since we've been launching the book and talking to different groups and analyzing some of the data that's coming back on that agency practices inventory, the API that many of you took. We are finding that people who don't move a lot are also reporting. They're on screens a lot. And it makes perfect sense. In this digital age, more and more people are tethered to their devices and are, able, are unable to get outside, are unable to be able to sort of break and get into movement. So what happens inside the brain of your kids when they move? This, by the way, is just simple, free play. Leaving kids to their own devices, they begin to explore. They begin to get into motion. It's the natural state of childhood. So we know from electroencephalogram studies, this is Hillman from University of Illinois, done a series of really nice studies, more blood flow goes to the brain. Eh, we already know that, right? Makes sense. Heart rate goes up a little bit, more blood gets circulated, more oxygenation to the brain, but it actually translates to increased electrical activity. So that's what these slides show, that even after you know, a couple of minutes of just walking, if you walk, you'll have more electrical activity in your brain. Well, so what? Does that translate to anything? Well, we know it's healthy for the brain. Yes, because Hillman also did some terrific studies, one of which was to have kids 
do sedentary behavior, and another group for the same amount of time would go outside and yeah, sort of unstructured, general play, fit kids kinds of things. And then had them all sit in front of monitors and test them out in terms of their cognitive abilities as you would suspect where I'm headed with this, the kids who actually had 30 or 40 minutes of some free play, particularly outdoors, they showed a superior cognitive advantage than kids who were sitting and just reading or on screens. They were better at not jumping to every little piece of stimulation that came at them. They were able to sort of not distract themselves and stay focused, for which is something we give many, many kids medication for. They were also able to have more fluid thinking. They could sort of see problems in new ways and solve problems better. It's not an inconsequential finding. I think it's actually directing us to get movement constantly, not just at home, but in the schools. And the other really important line of research, started about 10 years ago, is that the gray matter of the brain is actually increasing in volume with movement. And this isn't just for kids where they're Neurology, their, their, their brain growth is pretty rapid, particularly in the early years, but it's also true for very old people who've been depressed even. Study after study, if you're keeping up with what's been coming out, keeps confirming that it looks like matter, gray matter in the brain increases with movement. It's the one up here on the left side that I care the most about, or at least what I want to share with you, in the prefrontal cortex. That's where critical thinking comes into play, and that's really central to human agency, particularly as we move into the next set you probably have heard of executive functioning, right? Frontal cortex, executive functioning. Many of you may have kids who see executive function coaches. Some of you may be executive coaches, executive function coaches. Um, all I would hope that you think about is that you constantly add movement at some point into what you're doing all throughout your day because it makes no sense to try to train kids to focus and use critical thinking and use that frontal cortex for their executive functions if they're not bolstering the volume of that part of their brain. Incredibly important. Now, in the interest of move, because you've been sitting eh, maybe a good 40 minutes, 45 minutes, I want you to stand. I want you to take a little stretch and see how that feels. Doesn't that feel better? <laughs> Doesn't that feel like your body was signaling you to stand many times? Think about what it feels like when our kids are at school. Think about when we're in long meetings. Think about a really long play <laughs> where you're sitting for that length of time. You're on a flight, a bus ride a car ride. The body is not meant to be this sedentary as we tend to be. So every now and then, Paul and I are introducing this into our work just to give people that little bit of rejuvenation. You want to stretch, take another 30 seconds or so, move it around a little bit. I really appreciate that. It's great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to pass it now on to my colleague, Paul, who's going to bring us into the uh, cognitive principles, the last four. He's going to do the heavy lifting because these are, these are more complex. So good evening. Really nice to see all of you tonight. And thank you for listening to us. Um, as Tony just said, I'm going to cover the cognitive principles of agency. These are a little more complex than the behavioral principles. They involve how we think, how we learn, and how we regulate our emotions. Um, they're, and they're absolutely central to, to, to agency. Um, these four cognitive principles relate, all build in a sort of synergistic fashion to how we make decisions in our lives, which is central to, to agency. As, as Tony, I think, said nicely, agency, human agency is about our capacity to make choices um, which, of course, centers on, on decision-making. So the first cognitive principle we call position yourself as a learner. Um, this is essentially about generating more insight into yourself and into the world around you, um, the capacity to make sense of, of your immediate environment, 
and, to, and adapt to that environment is, is, is critical to success. As we think about positioning yourself as a learner, it, the goal is really, as I said earlier, to develop insight, not simply just knowledge. Um, I think what is being called on for, for kids today is they think about the 21st century and being productive in their lives is what matters is how they make sense of things, how they make meaning of things, and what they do with that. So the, 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 the sort of core competencies that positioning yourself as a learner builds is the capacity to think about how you think, to, to assess the quality of your own thinking and to be somewhat objective in doing that. It, it also has to do with uh, learning more about how you learn, which is we all learn in different ways. Some, some modes of learning work better for, for some people than for others. Having an awareness of how you learn best is another aspect, an important aspect to position yourself as a learner. And then the, the third thing is, you know, critical thinking has become really an essential skill uh, for the 21st century. Um, the capacity to think critically about the information that you're exposed to, make, again, make sense of it and, um, and figure out what needs to be done is, you know, you see this is critical thinking. You see critical thinking now pretty much on every job description um, there is because of how central it is. And something to build on what that Tony talked about is the, the sort of herd instinct that we as humans all have. Um, with you know the rise of of of, of mass media, um, you know the proliferation of it. You know this has become a bigger bigger issue, it, which is you know how we are influenced by each other, and the capacity to engage in more independent thought is is another key aspect of of agency, which positioning yourself as a learner, getting getting good at this principle helps you with. So. Uh, this slide relates to something that I use in my work more and more, which is, which is about humility. And uh, I think being humble, uh, there's a lot being written about this in the workplace now in terms of leaders. Um, nobody knows everything anymore. And the capacity to, to open yourself up to, to learning from other people is critical. I'm working with a young man right now who has a brilliant technical mind, uh, but he does not position himself as a learner in his interactions with other people. And he's gotten himself into quite a lot of hot water at, at his place of employment uh, because people don't want to work with him. He turns them off. And, um, and, and also the quality of his work product is suffering. Um, so he's having to learn how to do that. and. Um, it's really a matter of just opening himself up, being more collaborative, um, and a lot of that has to do with how he positions himself as a learner. The next principle of agency we call manage emotions and beliefs. This is probably one of the most difficult of, of all the principles. Um, it really involves uh, how how uh, it, it correlates to emotional and social intelligence, but it, 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 it concerns itself with how we regulate our emotions, how we understand what we're feeling and, and have some insight as to why we're feeling it. It has a lot to do with our success in school and a lot to do with our success at work. Um, as it turns out, human beings are primarily emotional creatures. We're, we're more emotional than thinking. And how well we manage our emotions um, largely determines uh, how successful we're going to be in life. So, you know, it, it also has a lot to do with impulsivity. And um, obviously for kids, um, helping them learn this along the way becomes a very important part of growing up. A couple of simple tips from the book on how to better manage emotions. The first one here is we call channel adrenaline. And you know, we, we, modern life produces adrenaline surges, right, all the time. I think we're all probably aware of that. 
But what do we do when we find ourselves in a situation when adrenaline is surging? Well, one simple thing to do uh, relates to a prior principle of agency, which is move. You know, get, get, you know, get your body into motion in some way, shape, or form. It's the best way to reset the clock. And, um, and so in terms of this, um, you see the kids climbing a wall. There's, you know, uh, there's plenty of ways to, to engage in movement, as, as you know. But it's a simple way to rebalance yourself. Another key part of managing emotions and beliefs is, is n be careful not to spread anxiety. I, you know, I think it starts with being aware of when you're feeling really anxious and uh, being able to, to name that. And also, um, you know, then be aware of how you're coming across to other people. Because anxiety is, as it turns out, contagious. I mean, all emotions really spread through mirror neurons, you know, from person to person. And it doesn't help to spread anxiety around. Another key way of managing your emotions and beliefs, this kind of grows out of the work of, of a woman named Lisa Barrett, who's at Northeastern, who's done just brilliant work on, on emotions. She wrote a book a few years back called How Emotions Are Made, completely upended um, existing theory on how emotions are made inside of us. Um, and she, one of the things she talks about is the value of what she refers to as emotional granularity. And what this means is when we have a better ability to more precisely define what it is we're feeling, um, it helps it helps us have greater insight, not just into ourselves, but also into what we need to do with that emotion, if anything. So one of the aspects of managing your emotions and beliefs is to try to get to greater emotional granularity. This wheel here, you may not be able to read all of it, but you know, it's, it's a simple wheel. You start from the center with something like joy, and then you, you go further out to the, to the outside, and you think about, well, what is, what, what's this, what am I really feeling? Am I feeling elated? Am I feeling uh, just cheerful? Um, and you know, then you, you, the goal is to get to the outside where you can kind of define with greater precision what it is you're actually feeling. The fourth tip is that when you're feeling overwhelmed, when you're feeling you know, an intense emotion that is getting in your way and is, 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 a, is a problem, one of the simplest things to do is to go back to one of the first behavioral principles of agency, which is get yourself to a quiet space, control stimuli, um, or, and or spend some time with someone who's a supportive listener who can hear you out and will help you process that emotion or move. Um, you can do all three simultaneously by simply grabbing you know, a, good, a good friend or a, a supportive coworker and um, getting outdoors and taking a walk and, and, and talking something through. The next principle, cognitive principle, we call check your intuition. This is, in some respects, a, 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 a for many people, kind of the, a head scratcher. They're not sure what, okay, what does this have to do with agency? Well, it turns out that this is based in research, the research of Kahneman and Tversky, who, who did roughly 30 years of, of work and thinking deeply about how we as human beings think. Most of the decisions you make each and every day are intuitively based decisions. Uh, that is, there, it's, 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 it's fast thinking, it's more automatic thinking. Um, it's our primary mode of actually making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And what's interesting is how little most people really know about intuition. I mean, most people feel they have some idea what it is, but for many people, they think it's, it's akin to astrology or, you know, reading your horoscope or it's, it's, it's touchy-feely stuff that really, um, you know, just not my thing, you know? And so, so what it is, what intuition is, is something that um, there, there are several different types, and we go into great detail about the different types of intuition and how and when to use them, but what is interesting about intuition is when, when we have full access to it, we, we make better decisions. 
But it also requires reflection, which, you know, we reflect in more in periods of quiet and, and periods where we're not overstimulated. So in some ways, in our, the way we live today, which again, if we are making most of our decisions um, based on intuition, uh, and we're also in a very harried and overstimulated place so much of the time, clearly that's not, that's not gonna benefit us in terms of our decision making. So there are three basic types of, this, of intuition. Um, these are the primary ones, and we go into some length about what each one is, when it's useful to use each type, and, um, and, and also you know, how to develop it better, because I think in some ways it's, a, it's sort of a mysterious thing, and yet it's something we use each and every day. The fourth and final cognitive principle of agency we call deliberate then act. This is another important part of how we make decisions. This is, relates to what we call slow thinking. And this again is based on the research of Kahneman and Tversky who in doing intensive study on this topic found that we essentially use two systems when we think. And as I said earlier, the primary mode of thinking that we engage in m most of the time is fast thinking. It's system one thinking, which is more intuitively based. It's, it's sort of quick uh, rule of thumb kind of thinking. It's, it's, you know, some people call it, you know, shortcut thinking. It, certainly when you drive your car, you're engaging in something we call expert intuition, which is you've driven your car for many, many, many miles over many, many hours in your life. And many of the decisions you make are really pretty automatic and very, very, very uh, sort of, you do it without really thinking much at all consciously about it. System two thinking is quite different. It takes a lot more energy. Um, it has rules. It's logic driven. Um, and it's absolutely essential to good quality decision making when you're dealing with a complex problem and, and also something that is of great importance in your life. Now, the research on this is, is pretty interesting in that what, what, what we've found, what Kahneman and Tversky and many others have found is that, you know, human beings are surprisingly not particularly strong decision makers. And, um, particularly when we don't even, we don't really even, most people don't even know how it all works. They don't even know how, they, how their minds work, how they make decisions. Um, and as particularly today in the current environment where people are so overstimulated um, by everything going on, um, that obviously gets in the way as well. But system two thinking is, is something, it's a skill, it's something that can be learned, it's something that can be developed and can be consciously applied once it has been learned. And again, it's, it's this type of more analytical thinking is particularly important to have the capability to do that is particularly important in important for big decisions, big decisions in one's life. What we found from interviewing a, a wide range of expert decision makers is that, you know, most, most expert decision makers, this is, these are people who have to make decisions, important decisions, as a part of their day-to-day -day lives. I mean, so um, these people use frameworks in helping them make decisions. They, in other words, they have certain rules. They have certain actual frameworks that help them reason through and make sense of complex problems. A few of the rules that they use um, that were common across all of these groups were things like setting aside enough time to engage in system two thinking. It, it takes time, it takes energy to do it. Uh, we, one of the people we interviewed uh, was the, the uh, head of uh, intelligence for the Boston Police Department. Um, this guy works each and every day really as, as head of Homeland Security for the city of Boston. He's dealing with all kinds of very complex situations. He happened to be right on site at the Boston Marathon bombing 
of several years ago and had to make some incredibly pivotal decisions in the midst of that crisis. Um, and he said something very interesting on this topic. He said, um, when you're trying to solve a complex problem, which he does many times a week, he said, if you don't have the time, make the time. But it does take time to, to use system two thinking. It also, you know, it helps to have some people to turn to to give advice um, in, in engaging in this kind of system, this conscious system two thinking. In putting it all together, you know, just in a simple sort of graphic for you to kind of grasp, I think, to, you know, we've talked about a lot of stuff so far, but I want to put together a simple X, Y axis grid for you um, that might help just to kind of cement what we've talked about so far. So if we think about the Y axis as being poor judgment moving up to sound judgment, and we think about the x-axis being fearful inaction to confident action. Obviously, most of you would probably say, well, if I'm going to be in one quadrant, or, uh, one quadrant or another, I think I'd rather be in the upper right quadrant, right? <laughs> At least most of the time. So if we plot then what it's like to be in these quadrants, you know, to obviously, being in the lower left quadrant is, is, a, is a pretty unpopular, unpleasant place to be. Um, being in the lower left quadrant, you know, can be a miserable experience for the people around that person. A lot of times, if someone in that quadrant's pretty happy and... Lower right, I think. What's that? You said lower left, lower right. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, lower right. Sorry, lower right. And uh, one of my colleagues used to describe people in that lower right quadrant, which he included himself in that quadrant, as often wrong, never in doubt. Um, the upper left quadrant is a place where we see a lot of the people we work with as being in this quadrant a lot of the time. We tend to, you know, Tony and I both in our practices, I work with business people uh, for the most part. He works with kids and families. And we work with a pretty um, high-functioning, high-achieving group of people. And what we found is that among that group, um, they spend a lot of time in that upper uh, left quadrant. And I put myself in that quadrant much of the time as well. It's, it's you know, there's always more information to be gained. There's always, you know, always, you know, postponing the decision to get to get even that last little bit of, of, of information. So the goal here is obviously to be in the upper right quadrant, which is agency, which is having access to good quality decision making and having a sense of confidence that you can move forward and act on that information, act on that decision. So um, in terms of your kids, um, you know, the question, the thing that we, we think about a lot, Tony and I talked a lot about as we prepared for this talk with you tonight, is how do you help your kids to practice this? And one of the key ways to help your kids l develop greater agency in, in their lives is, is to let them make decisions. Let them make their own decisions. You can help them with those decisions. You can question them on them and um, probe a bit. But let them make their own decisions. Let them make mistakes help them to learn from those mistakes and see that the whole idea is that we can't ever make perfect decisions all the time and it's not it's not even useful to strive for perfection but we can learn from mistakes and we can recover from mistakes i often coach some of my my business executives on this topic a lot because the pressure is high in in business and um and people are worried about making a bad decision and what will happen if they do that. And so what I coach them on is I say, you know, instead of investing all your energy in making the perfect decision, invest your, your, your confidence in your capacity to recover from mistakes. And so, one, and so what you should strive for, in other words, is being absolutely world class at recovery and put your energy there as opposed to trying to be perfect. I think 
In a couple of minutes, we're going to take some questions. So I want you to be thinking about seeing this model uh, and, and formulating a couple of questions. And uh, we really will value your feedback. And, and often there's other people who are thinking the same thing, uh, but don't ask. So consider that for a moment. So, so there you go. There's, there's the model. There's the seven principles. We know there's three of them that are behavioral. Control stimuli, associate selectively, and move. We know those are ones that we can teach younger kids. We know that there's the cognitive ones that Paul walked us through. And those certainly can be applied to kids who are then hitting that mark of around fifth, sixth grade and up. I'd, I'd like to just take this last section of our talk and move it into the idea of like, how do we think about this and how does it inform the problems and the stresses, the issues, the challenges we have, can agency be a lens through which to understand this a little better? So most problems don't show up until kids go to school. And teachers usually flag something, and it tends to be first a learning issue. And then sometimes we test or we just sort of follow it for a while and sometimes a diagnosable learning issue can pop up, particularly in lower grades. And then we start to see the behavior problems start up. And there's certainly there's overlap between these two. Be, excuse me, uh, psychological problems which tend to be behavioral, such as ADHD and attention and focus and impulsivity, but sometimes separation anxiety, kids who don't want to go into school or to meet new kids or social anxiety issues, things like that. What's interesting is I've made the learning problems bubble big and the psychological problems bubble smaller, if you kind of can see that. In a couple of years, as we move past the early grades into middle school and up, those bubbles are going to reverse. If anything, the learning challenges and problems will shrink, and then we're going to see a ballooning of more adjustments, psychological, emotional issues that pop up. Be that as it may, this is how we see everything when there's a problem in a classroom. So we presented this to a group of teachers, elementary school teachers, from pre-kindergarten to sixth, and we trained them as we've just gone through. We did it in a lot more detail, however, in a workshop on agency. Asked them to start thinking about how they would apply it to themselves and their lives. They could be better leaders. They could model it for their kids, how they would begin to integrate it into the classroom. And then we asked them, think about all the issues that you now think are actually caused by agency. What if having low agency has something to do with a lot of the problems we've been diagnosing and or they are contributing to the diagnosable problems for which we spend lots of money fixing and lots of time and energy trying to treat. And they came up with a list on their own that we recorded. And it occurred to me, and I don't know if you can all read them, but things like feeling overwhelmed, oversensitive to feedback, stomach and headaches, lack of creativity, easily irritated, not participating, it occurred to me as I was reading this list, I'm hearing these complaints from parents and teachers of kids who are in high school now. That wasn't always the case. There seems to be a growing sense of complaints and not being able to do it and feeling overwhelmed, stomach aches and headaches and things like this, now in older and older kids. Some of your kids, if they're older, may actually be experiencing these type of problems, issues, whatever you want to call them, more today than we used to see years ago. And it also occurred to me that many of them were used as symptoms to justify a diagnosis in learning and, be, and, and psychological problems. We're trying to help see the whole child as maybe needing agency versus is there something more presumed neurobiological going on in them that deserves or requires immediate treatment. This was an eye-opener for us. We didn't until we actually brought the model out and gave it to people in the field of their work, particularly teachers, did we see the overlap. I want you to also not misunderstand that we're only concerned about kids who are showing problems or stress reactions. In many ways, the kids who are showing stress reactions are very, very direct, honest, and showing their problems on their sleeves, so to speak. They're actually having 
natural stress reactions to a lot of the demands that we all live with nowadays. What about the kids who are invisible? The kids that are achieving so well, they sort of like fly under that radar screen. Hiding in plain sight. These are the types of things to be on the lookout for if your kid is super high achieving, super, super, super perfectionistic and competitive with rigid beliefs and this like sense of, I've got it all, I'm good, it's always good. Look for these types of things. You may have a kid who's actually got low agency, a kid who really doesn't feel that they're in control of their destiny, doesn't really call the shots in their life, is sort of going through the motions, is getting rewarded heavily for it, believes that that's what they need to do, but we've seen a lot of these kids go into crisis suddenly, and I've been experiencing that just the last couple of years, where some of the top performers of kids, if you will, the star athletes, the kids who are taking lots of excelled classes, who are involved in lots of activities, seem happy, have friends, suddenly just one day, and then I work mostly with boys and young men, they just, as Paul likes to say, they go on strike. They just don't want to get out of their, their beds. And the parents are just panicked, like, what do you mean? What do you mean? I, and I don't find any meaning in this anymore. I don't know why I'm doing this. The older ones can verbalize it pretty well. They're having like little, well, I shouldn't say little, they're having full-blown existential crises at like, you know, 14, 15, and 16 years old. But you know what? It's, it's, again, it's a healthy response to question, am I just doing this for the wrong reasons or for other reasons? Am I losing myself in this process? In other words, their agency is really, really low. How does sustained stress lead to decreased personal agency and what we can do about it? So this is most of how I think it's happening. We live in a modern world, accelerating demands, it's just hard to keep up with. which We're just not able to adapt always as well, given so much that's coming at us. The more that happens, we lose agency. Sometimes we show symptoms. So I think the most important part of this is this last statement, can we regain control? This echoes Salman Rushdie's comment about, is the world shaping us or are we shaping the world? And really ask yourself, how much do you really believe or perceive or feel or know that the world is something that you actually are being directed by rather than having the ability to shape it? So let's look at how we understand when things go wrong with us. Because I think actually there's a bias in how we determine problems when we're experiencing them that we're actually giving away a lot of our agency in the process. In other words, we have a lot more control than we realize, but let's look at how we do it. This is the traditional medical model, neuropsychiatric way of looking at when problems exist. They always exist, I'm being a little dramatic, in the person. There's a presumed neurobiological condition going on that then acts out onto the world and creates these problems, these symptoms that we observe, that we can give a label to, or say, cluster in a certain way, that can be diagnosed, and then, of course, they can be treated in various ways. You know, in all the years I've practiced, I've only had a kid come in as the kid with the problem. In other words, the identified patient is always a particular child. It isn't both parents saying, yeah, we fight a lot, or we're under a lot of stress, or we're taking care of an elderly parent. It's not a teacher coming in along with the child saying, yeah, this has been a really hard year for me to teach, or I have too many kids in my classroom and it's chaotic. It's always about there's something in the brain of the child. Now, what if we could look at this from the entire other angle? What if we have a lot of this wrong? What if it's the other direction? What if the world around us is constantly asking us to do more with high competition or at a rate that just exceeds what we can possibly do? Rushing our development, hyper-competition. What if that's acting on the brain and that's, in fact, what's causing a lot of what we're seeing, again, to think back to that classroom example? So we're missing the point. We think it's inside the brain. Yes, the brain registers it and processes it and displays it outward, but what if the origins of it are things that are under our control? If they're coming from the outside, can't we shape the environment? Can't we make choices? Can't we use our agency to begin to be healthier? There's a term, biologically, for being overwhelmed. It's called allostatic overload. Now, allostatic load is normal. That just simply means you're under some stress, 
your body's reacting, a little bit of adrenaline, maybe a little bit of cortisol to get released. Your body then rallies, you develop some coping strategies, you adjust, now you're stronger. Stress is actually good. You should strive, you should succeed, you should achieve. But when it exceeds your ability to do so, the body overreacts and puts you into a constant ongoing threat mode where adrenaline stays, cortisol shows up, prepared for what's coming next, even though there may be nothing coming. Confidence plummets. And we learned from the early part of the talk, when confidence is low, it's almost like a gateway that welcomes anxiety and stress reactions to surface. Resiliency plummets. The ability to take hold of our challenges, be stressed out for a little bit, but make something better that then we carry forever from that point on. That's what happens when, when we're looking at people in our particular work streams as having low agency. So a closing thought here before we take some questions. You remember in the very early part of the talk, I put up something that looked like this to distinguish between anxiety and stress. And I showed that there was this relationship between the two, that if you've got a lot of anxious feelings or negative feelings, it's actually going to cause your body to overreact to smaller stresses outside you. When there's stresses outside you and you perceive them to be threats, it actually raises up your anxiety emotions. And these things play off each other a lot. When you find yourself really ruminating, when you find yourself obsessing, when you find yourself with heart palpitations or stress, however your brain and body likes to tell you you're in overwhelm, go first to the first three practices, the behavioral practices. They handle those stress signals best. Heavy lifting, particularly for kids who are older, you have to go to the cognitive ones if you're going to attack the emotions in your mind. But I think most of it actually starts on the right side. If you really tease it apart, something signaled you and made you feel that there was something stressful, then as you thought about it, your emotions started to perk up. So the more that you can identify this earlier, and we love to work with kids and teach them how to read the signals in their bodies so they can immediately make a change. They can stand up, they can walk over here, they can seek out a person, they can go to a quiet spot. It could be a complete game changer versus kids who stay stuck in chairs ruminating about negative things. We put together an infographic that you can get on the website under resources. Uh, it's printable. And we thought it's helpful because sometimes it's hard to know exactly these seven and keep them in the mind. So they have the definitions from the book as long, along with the, 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 the particular icons that we've been using tonight. So feel free to distribute those, to print one up for yourself, give it to others. We will take a couple of questions right now. I want to say thank you for for having us in and for letting us sort of walk you through this. I know that's a lot of material. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very, um, in many ways, uh, you know, I wonder if you guys should be getting, you know, some college credit for this. Um, but it is a system and it's, and most of what we do to take care of all the stress we have now, we have things that we throw at it, right? We have like, you know, do, a mo you know, do some mindfulness or here's your good thought of the day or maybe I could, you know, take up a yoga class. Or it, it's more like symptom management. It's like chasing that negative feeling. This, again, is more of a systemic way to really get ahead and from your core outward to really begin to control like, the outcome of everything. So love, love to hear your thoughts and reactions and questions.